uh, joined us. We'll get started in uh, oh, three or four minutes. So welcome to those who joined us. We'll get started in just a couple minutes. Well, welcome everyone. We're just going to wait a minute or two while uh, a few more folks join us. But if you could, if you could find your chat window, open up your chat window. Um, it might appear at the bottom on the right-hand corner with a little arrow, uh, and you just have to click on that arrow to sort of open it up. And then change the to, it'll have an option to send a chat to, change that to all participants. And then go ahead and enter in the chat uh, message box just where you are right now, what uh, your location, your, um, if you're in the U.S., city, state, or um, city, uh, state, and country, if you'd like, just to share that out so folks can get an idea of where folks are today. Great, thanks. People are jumping on and doing it. There's someone from Algeria, that's wonderful. So if you've just joined us, we're gonna get started in about a minute or two. We're just giving a minute for some more folks to join in. But if you wanna find the chat window, it's in the bottom right-hand corner. Just click on that little arrow to open up, change it to all participants in terms of who you send it to, and just put uh, where you are right now, your city and state or country, um, and share that out. Just one more minute and then we'll start. So great, I appreciate everybody uh, sharing on the chat. Just gives us a sense of where folks are. We really got folks from all across the country and individual from Algeria, so that's wonderful. If you have just called in, there are uh, slides that we're viewing, so you wanna also connect to the link so that you can see the slides. They'll be very helpful as we go through uh, the webinar as well. All right, well, I think we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Jay Otto. I'm a research scientist with the Center for Health and Safety Culture, and I really appreciate you all um, taking the time to join us for this webinar today. I wanna begin just with a little bit about WebEx. 
Um, if for some reason you should get disconnected from the phone during the call, if your audio drops, um, you can click on the little phone icon um, at the bottom. If you go to the bottom of your screen, you get a little toolbar pop up. And that can give you an option. The system can call you, you can call in, or you can use um, the audio over your computer. Usually, uh, WebEx has gotten to where it's not dropping folks, but if that suddenly happens, that, that's what you want to do is just jump on and use that. We will, um, I will be asking you some questions and thoughts uh, about, uh, to, to gather your um, thinking during the webinar. So a little bit of interactivity, and we'll use the chat box to do that. So just as we use the chat box here just to share where you were, I'll ask you some questions. Do make sure that when you share it, you uh, share it to all participants so that everybody can see your responses. I'll, I'll uh, talk to those uh, as well, but it'd be great if you can also read them. If during the presentation uh, you've got some questions, you can start, uh, you can put those in the chat box as well. You can also use the question and answer panel, which is just below the chat box panel. And um, I can see that there are a number of other folks on the, uh, with the center who are um, helping deliver this webinar as well. So they can see those questions and they might be able to respond in real time. I will try to keep my eye on those too. I might respond in real time or I might delay and we can try to connect with those at the end if we've got some time. Just quickly about the center, um, we are a very interdisciplinary center. We have folks on staff from a wide variety of different backgrounds. And our focus is really on serving communities and organizations um, through research training and guidance. Um, we don't just do research. Um, we, do, we do research, but we also think it's critically important to get that information out to the people doing the work. So a critical component of our work is doing training and guidance as well. All of our research is applied. Um, the sponsors who support us to do that research tend to be states, um, we have some federal projects, some community projects, but there are agencies that are wanting to move the needle on very specific issues. So we don't do sort of odd experiments with college students in elevators and then just sort of publish papers on that. All of our work is out in the field uh, in real environments with, with communities really working to improve the health and safety of individuals. Um, we principally work in four core areas or with four core issues, although we do work outside of these as well. We do a fair amount of work in traffic safety. We have historically done a lot of work on the preventing the misuse of substances. We continue to work in that uh, domain. We've done some work and supportive work around domestic violence, interpersonal violence, and child well-being, child maltreatment. And of course, um, as you know, these issues overlap. We, we see that very much uh, at the community level, at the state level. We know that individuals uh, who may misuse substances are more likely to potentially drive impaired, and that's a major issue with traffic safety. We know that uh, child well-being, child maltreatment can be a contributing factor to later in life potentially misusing substances or other issues. So all of these are interrelated, and our research is really trying to look at some overarching approaches, lessons, frameworks that we can apply broadly to these issues, but also specifically so we can really move the needle. So, for example, we have projects to increase seatbelts or um, specifically address misuse of substances among high school students. So it can be very specific, but we, we like to take that big picture lens as well with across all of our research to connect the dots and see how these issues overlap and how we can look at lessons and frameworks and processes that can support all of them. This is just a map of some current and past projects. This is also on our website, so it's interactive on the website. If you go to the website, you can actually point to the tab and it can give you a little bit more background information about a project in a particular area. But we just show this uh, to indicate that while we're located at Montana State University, which is in Bozeman, Montana, we do work all across the country. We've done a couple of projects in Canada as well. And we're certainly interested in doing work um, all across the country and around the globe, depending upon uh, interest of sponsors. I want to thank you for joining us today. Um, but more importantly, I want to thank you for your work in this field. 
Uh, I am making the assumption that if you join this webinar today, you do some work to improve the health and safety of communities and individuals that you serve. And I think far too often that work is not recognized, it's underappreciated, um, but we really appreciate that at the center. Everybody who works at the center uh, is involved in research, but they're also first and foremost just very passionate about improving the health and safety of people. And we know that that aligns with you as well, and we wanna thank you for the work that you do um, to address this in the communities that you serve. This is very difficult work. At time it's, times it's very trying work, um, but we consider uh, along with you probably that it's extremely important work as well. So to open up, I wanna ask a quick poll question. I'm gonna open this poll, and this just allows us to get a little bit of connection with who you are. So um, I'm gonna open that up. It'll open up a panel on your side. And if you can quickly just give us an indication of what you're uh, typically working on. It, you might work on multiple issues, but just pick one. What's the issue that, that tends to take uh, most of your focus? And I do have that other category, um, so feel free to use that as well. So go ahead and click in. I can see that a number of you already have. Uh, so continue, just find that. Um, we'd love to hear from all of you. Just find that polling panel and click in. We've got a couple of questions that I'm gonna ask you for, through polls. So this is a way to get to know each other, but it's also a practice for some of the questions that we're gonna use in a minute. Almost everybody's completed, just a few more folks to complete it. All right. So I'm gonna go ahead and, go ahead and close that, close that, I'm gonna open it up so you can see the responses. So what you can see is um, we've got some folks who are, are working on the misuse of substances. We've got a um, number of folks working on traffic safety, uh, maybe a few folks working on child maltreatment. No one on the, on the call right now working on violence. Some folks working on organizational safety, which may encompass other, uh, a multitude of things and, and one other. So thanks for joining in. Um, it's interesting to see the mix, and we really enjoy that mix. And that, that's uh, certainly uh, very similar to the work that we do in terms of working with a variety of, of uh, behaviors and, and a lot of different issues out in community. All right, so thanks for joining, or uh, thanks for participating in that. So the purpose of today's webinar is to share three lessons. Um, and the lessons are to facilitate transforming health and safety culture around really growing health, health and safety culture. It is not to say that by any means these are the only three lessons. These are three lessons that we, we really come back to all the time in our work. Um, they ground a lot of our thinking, a lot of our approach, and we just find them come up time and time again across all the different kinds of projects that we work. So that's our intention with the webinar is to share those. Now, I do want to take a moment and talk about, like, what do we mean by trap or health and safety culture, and how are we defining culture? Culture is an extremely complex idea, very complex concept. And certainly in academic settings, different disciplines have very different definitions of culture. The definition that we use is that it's the values, assumptions, and beliefs in other words, a belief system that is shared by a group of people that influence behaviors related to health and safety. Now, we are not claiming that this is the only definition of culture, the right definition of culture. We simply are saying it is a definition of culture. And we like it because we can operationalize it, we can measure it, we can grow it, we can assess the culture's relationship to behaviors, and that becomes very uh, important in our work. Uh, some key aspects of this is that we're talking about values, assumptions, and beliefs, in other words, cognitions, things in our head, our belief systems, and that they are shared. Not that everyone has them, but what we would say is that most people have them. And in particular, we're looking at the values, assumptions, and beliefs that influence behaviors related to health and safety. 
And of course, there are a lot of behaviors related to health and safety, even within a specific issue. So even when we look at a, a very maybe straightforward issue like wearing a seatbelt, there are a multitude of values, assumptions, and beliefs around whether an individual wears a seatbelt, whether an individual asks other people to wear a seatbelt, whether a family has a family rule about wearing a seatbelt, whether a workplace has a workplace policy and training about wearing seatbelts and enforces that policy, whether law enforcement enforces laws, whether communities or states adopt secondary or primary laws around seatbelt use, all of those are behaviors related to seatbelt use, and all of those will have uh, belief systems associated with them. So while this definition seems pretty simple, it can get complicated quickly when we start getting into issues and recognizing the, the multitude of behaviors that can surround an issue. All right, I'd love to begin with this slide, uh, this quote. This is a quote from a researcher at MIT, Otto Scharmer. He does a lot of work with uh, communities and organizations that are undergoing change. And what he recognized in his work is that the leader's interior work deals with meeting and mastering three enemies. And all of you, because you're on this call, are leaders in this work, right? You, you engaged to come to this webinar because you're engaged in this work and there are, thereby are a leader in this work, whether it's in your organization, in your community, in, in the areas that you serve. And so I first bring this out as guidance for you. And that is that when, whenever we're in a context of learning or allowing something new to emerge, it's very valuable for us to quiet these voices, the voices of judgment, cynicism, and fear. It is not that we wanna always quiet these voices. There are times when we need to listen to these voices and these voices are extremely important. But in the context of allowing something new to emerge, it can be very important to quiet these voices. Now, how do you quiet these voices? Well, that takes practice. And really what we would say is it begins by simply noting their awareness. So in you, as I share ideas today, might notice that you start looking and thinking about an idea and saying, well, that's silly, or my gosh, that would never work in my community or with the people that I deal with, or I'm not sure I'm willing to go there. But those could all be voices potentially of judgment, cynicism, and fear. And what I ask you to do is just temporarily quiet those voices so you can allow new ideas to come to you and potentially new things to emerge. It's not that this is easy, it takes a lot of practice, but it's a really important skill and something that becomes value, really important as we try to transform health and safety cultures, as well as deal with the leaders who are doing that work, like yourselves. So I wanna begin by asking you some questions. Questions are a great tool to help us challenge our own thinking, to help us grow, and to help us learn and see new things. And this is the first question I wanna ask. This is a question that was asked by Stephen Covey, a, a, a guru on leadership, personal leadership, organizational leadership, but it's a hard question. And it really motivated at the center, if we look back at the origins of our work, it motivated a lot of our work. And at the early days of the center, we really focused primarily on the prevention and the misuse of substances. Over the years, we've grown to address other issues as well. And quite frankly, in the early days of the prevention around the misuse of substances, there were many strategies that were ineffective. They were quite frankly busy. Some of them were even harmful. But in all of our work, all of your work to improve health and safety, you wanna think about how are you becoming more effective? All of us are busy. All of us can stay busy all the time in this work. But truly, what gets us out of bed in the morning is being effective. So if you take nothing else from today's webinar, I hope you take this question and the courage to take the time to ask it. And it's important to note, it takes time to ask it. In other words, sometimes we're so busy, we can't even ask a question like this. But if you allow your space to ask this question, it can really be transformative. The first time I heard this question, I, I was managing a prevention office. 
And I began to ask this question of a lot of the activities that I did. Is this staff meeting that I'm having busy or effective? Is this report that I'm filling out for the state busy or effective? Is this program that I'm su supporting or funding in my community busy or effective? Do I know? And if it's just busy and not effective, why do I keep doing it? So it's a difficult question. It's a question that requires us to quiet the voices, particularly potentially the, the voice of fear, but it's a really important transformative question. So what I want to do now is just share some additional uh, lessons from research, or three lessons from research, and the goal of these lessons is to help you be more effective. It's all in the lens of being more effective. All right. So I want to begin by asking another polling question. I'm going to go up and get my poll ready. And what I want you to do is I want you to give your best guess. I know you're sitting in a computer and you could easily Google this. I don't want you to Google this. I just want you to give your gut reaction. What's your immediate response to this? Even if this isn't your area or your domain or, or you're not even from the United States and you don't know U.S. data, that's fine too. I just want you to give your gut reaction. So the question I want to ask you is how has drinking, drinking alcohol, among U.S. 12th graders changed in the past 30 years? So I'm going to go ahead and open up the poll. That gives you an opportunity to answer on your little polling panel. This is an interesting question, obviously, to ask if you work in the misuse of substances. It's actually a really important question to ask if you work in traffic safety because we know one of the leading causes of crashes among young drivers is alcohol. Alcohol is a significant contributing factor. This is an interesting question to ask of community members and parents. And it's a really interesting question to ask of 12th graders. I used to go into health classes and I would ask 12th graders this very question. And I was really curious to see how they would respond. So go ahead and click in. I'll give you another uh, few seconds. I'd like to get as many responses as we can. Everybody click in. Make sure you've submitted your response. All right, I'm going to close. It's going to take a few seconds to close the poll. Just make sure you submit it, and then we'll look at your responses. So as I said, this is a great question to ask a, a wide variety of stakeholders, even if, even if the prevention of uh, underage drinking is not your issue, because it certainly overlaps with um, a lot of other issues as well. All right, so let's see what you thought. Okay, so popped up on your screen, you should be able to see. So we had a few folks, about 10% thought it had increased significantly, about 10% thought it had increased slightly. A few folks thought it had stayed the same. Some of you thought it had decreased. Let's see, that's about 45%, uh, about almost half of you thought it had decreased. Some folks chose not to respond. So it's interesting. I know we all collectively across the country don't work together, but we work in, in related fields. And even just to note how us on the call today can have different perceptions about what's going on. So if we look at the actual data, what we see, the blue line is 30-day use of alcohol, the red line is binge drinking or drinking to get drunk. And what we can see is really significant decreases over the past um, several decades. And this is the result of a lot of work, right? There's been an enormous volume of work on this issue. Uh, a lot of people in a lot of communities at the community, state, and federal level working to reduce underage drinking. But it's not maybe what we thought. Some of us maybe thought it had been increasing. And it's particularly interesting when I used to talk to 12th graders, they often would think it was increasing. They often thought they drank much more than previous generations. All right, another question. Let me move to this one, open this one up as well. How has the percentage of weekend nighttime drivers with blood alcohol contents, BACs, 
over 0.08% change in the past 40 years. So weekend nighttime is the highest prevalence of drinking and driving. In all states in the United States, a blood alcohol content of 0.08% is the legal limit. There's some states where it's lower, 0.05. And of course, you could be legally impaired even if it was lower, but you were behaviorally indicating impairment. But this is the blood alcohol content level. And we wanted to see how, is this, how do you perceive this has changed in the past 40 years? So go ahead and click in. This is obviously very important if we think about um, people working in traffic safety. Uh, about a third of all fatal crashes in the United States involve alcohol. Uh, that's a lot. There are about 38,000 to 40,000 people who die every year in the United States in alcohol-related crashes, I mean, car vehicle-related crashes. About a third of those involve alcohol. So that as a public health issue, traffic safety is still a major public health issue. All right, I'll give it another minute. Make sure you've submitted your response. Click the Submit button if you haven't. Go, go ahead and close the poll. All right, let's see what you thought. Okay. So again, some variety of different opinions. We had about 23% of you who thought it had increased. We had a similar, uh, as we had last time, about 45% of you thinking it had decreased. And um, uh, looks like one person who thought it had stayed the same. Well, let's look at some of the data. So this is a very interesting um, survey result. This is not self-report data. This is a very expensive uh, protocol. It's called the National Roadside Survey, where they randomly select vehicles on roads on weekend nights. And they do both self-report, but th this data is based on biometric testing. So they uh, gather uh, breathalyzers, um, saliva samples, as well as blood samples. And so what we can see over this period of time is a significant decrease in uh, drivers with BACs over 0.08%. But there are some important things we need to take away from this graph. One is 1.5% 1 in 2013 is significantly lower than where we were in 1973. I mean, it's, it's drastically lower. However, 1.5% is still way too high when we think about public health risk. When we think about public health risk, if I go out on a Friday night and I drive on a highway and I pass 1,000 cars, 15 of them could be impaired. That's way too high level of risk. However, from a cultural lens, overwhelmingly, most people do not drink and drive. Most people don't drive after drinking anything and overwhelmingly people think it's wrong. So we want to start building our capacity to think about this both through a lens of uh, public health as well as uh, a cultural lens. All right, last one I want to switch over is to talk about uh, violence. So our last question, I'll open this up. How has the rate of violent victimizations among women this is in the United States, changed in the past 20 years. This is not police report data. Police report data is biased. Not everybody who experiences violence uh, reports it to the police. This is a, a pretty rigorous protocol. Um, and a violent victimization could be anything from being uh, physically hit, struck, to uh, sexual assault, rape, to murder. So it is, it is a full range of, of violence. Go ahead and click in. I know when we did the initial poll, we didn't really have folks working on violence, so um, this may not be in your domain, but that, that's why it's also very interesting to sort of see what you think about this. So click in, uh, even if you don't work in this field, just give your best guess. All right, let's see what you thought. So, a variety of different opinions. Um, 
we had about 45% of you, almost half, perceiving that it had increased, slightly less than a third of you saying it had increased significantly. Some folks thought it stayed the same, and a few folks thought it had decreased. So here are the data. Uh, the red line or the orange line is are amongst females. The blue line is amongst males. Um, and what we've seen is a, a pretty significant decrease maybe in the late 90s into the 2000s, and then it's been kind of flat. We, we do anticipate that there might be a slight uptick in 2019, and there are concerns that there could be an uptick in 2020 due to the pandemic. But overall, this might be different than some of what you all were thinking. So it's interesting. All of these questions were tr questions about trends. I was asking you, in essence, how are we doing? And what I want you to reflect on is, does it matter how we think things are going? And I'm just asking this rhetorically, not, not necessarily for you to respond at this time, but I want you to think about that in your head. Does it matter how we think things are going? Does it matter how those we serve think things are going? And how does it make you feel that some trends are actually improving? Now, this is not to say that our work is done by any means. We all know there is way too many harmful consequences around just these risky behaviors that we've been looking at, as well as a host of others. So it's by no means to say, oh, we're done. But it's interesting to think about it, how it might challenge our perceptions of what is going on. And if we can suspend all our disbelief, and I know you all are looking at that data and not believing it, that, that's normal. But if you can suspend that disbelief and momentarily check in with yourself as to how does it make you feel that we've actually made improvements, that, that through the hard work and efforts of many people, things have gotten better in some domain. Not that we're done, but that we've actually made some positive strides. So this comes back to a question that Albert Einstein once asked. He wants to ask one of the most important questions we should all ask ourselves is, is the universe a friendly place? Because how we choose to answer that question is gonna have a profound impact on how we choose to live our lives. So our first lesson that we're gonna focus on is based on that. And it's this notion that we need to raise concern and hope. Often in efforts to improve health and safety, we heavily focus on raising concern. Sometimes we even seek to create fear, and we're gonna talk about that. But we recognize the need to raise concern and hope. So let's unpack this a little bit. First off, the word hope. Hope is a, a word that can have lots of different meanings, and sometimes folks can give hope the sense that it's just sort of woo-woo. Um, we were doing some training with the U.S. Army, the individuals who work on um, helping to prevent sexual assaults and harassment. And one of the colonels in the training said, you know, we gotta, we got to be careful with this word hope because we have a phrase in the military, and that is hope is not a strategy. And we would totally agree. We're not just hanging our hat on some unknown notion that things will be better. Here's how the definition of hope that we use. We did not create this. This is a very academic definition of hope. But I want to present this to you because I want you to realize that hope does have a very scientific definition as the perceived capability to derive pathways to desired goals and motivate oneself via agency thinking to use those pathways. Now, what does that mean? That means that there's a willingness to move forward and seeing a path forward. In other words, very simply, a will and a way. And we think it's absolutely critical that in efforts to improve health and safety culture, we have to grow a will and a way to move forward. And in fact, if people don't have a will and a way to move forward, they can be hopeless and that can be very dangerous, both individually and collectively. So this, this notion, it's not easy, but this becomes part of our work, is that we have to grow 
a will and a way to move forward. So our core assumption at the center is that any work we do with any community that we serve is that the positive exists and is worth growing. That's going to be our starting place when we use a cultural lens. We're going to look at any organization, any community, any situation and say, where is the goodness here? Where is the positive here? It's here. We need to keep looking for it. And this is what we want to grow. We think this is just so important if we're going to take a cultural lens. Victor Frankel said it really well. If we're going to bring out the human potential at its best, we must first believe in its existence and its presence. And that can be a challenge, right? Because day in and day out, we can be going to crashes and seeing horrible consequences. We can be dealing with individuals who are coming through our doors with just horrific needs. And if we lose connection to that hope, that, that, that ability to, to grow and become better, we can easily become burned out. We can easily give up. We can easily become hopeless. Now, this is not the path that efforts to improve health and safety have often used. If you look at the early days and even efforts now to, for example, prevent the misuse of substances, we've historically used approaches called fear appeals, where we're really trying to scare people into adopting a behavior. We might use mock car crashes with teenagers to try to show them the negative consequences of what happens in drink and drive. And, and I've been in meetings and experienced individuals who said, Oh, it was just so effective. I had so many kids crying. And we just asked the question, like, is that the goal? Is our goal to get people crying? We've got to think about what's going on here. What is the impact that is taking place if we're trying to scare the people we serve into changing their behavior? The research is pretty clear. There can be significant unintended consequences. For example, there was a campaign that was done in Montana. It was privately funded. It was extremely graphic. The goal was to prevent the misuse of methamphetamines. The ads were highly emotional, very high recall. Everybody could remember the ads because they were so visceral and so emotional. And advertisers can say, see, we've won. We've been successful. Everybody can recall our ads. But we have to ask, like, what's the purpose? Is it just recall? Or are we trying to prevent methamphetamine use? And what some of the survey work shown was actually it, it, it may have had boomerang effects. It also had unintended consequences. What, one of the critical questions they asked, they asked parents, what would you do if you found out your child was using meth? And they asked a baseline before they did any media. And overwhelmingly, parents said, well, I'd, I'd contact a counselor. I'd contact uh, 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 my doctor. I would talk to a faith leader. I would go to the school. I would get help, which is what we want parents to do if they're concerned about their child. They ran the campaign for a couple of years. They repeated the survey. The percentage of parents who said they would get help went down. It went the wrong way. We want parents, if they're concerned about their kids, to get help, but the consequence of these media messages was they were afraid to go get help. What had happened is they had stigmatized, they had demonized people who use masks in these commercials, and then what parent wants to go to somebody else and say, I think my child is one of those monsters? That wasn't the intention of the media. That was an unintended consequence. So we have to really think about unintended consequences. The research has shown that fear appeals can absolutely label and stigmatize, expand social gaps, and even promote poor health as a value. Humiliation, shame, guilt, and angst are not the primary engines of change. Ironically, such experiences can even immobilize people. They can render them more change, more remote. And we want people to change, right? The path to improving health and safety is going to be about people changing, not, not hunkering down and refusing to change. So I want you to think about and, and pop up your chat window and go ahead and type in, what are your thoughts to this question? What's the difference between concern and fear? How would you respond to that? Go ahead, type in any thoughts. Make sure you share them with everybody else.
What do you think? What's the difference between concern and fear? Make sure you're sharing it with all participants. Good, so somebody was talking about anxiousness attached to it. Concern equals noticing, observing, thinking. Fear equals personalizing impact. Concern brings attention to something. Concern is having empathy. Fear can cause anxiety. Concern seems to express care for others, whereas fear promotes blame. Very interesting. Concern involves an act. Fear paralyzes. Concern is relating to something, while fear is an unpleasant emotion. Concern is a mild worry. More in the background, fear seems more immediate. Fear plus barriers. Fear can immobilize while concern can cause action. Concern is driven by legitimate feelings for the subject individual. Fear is reactive and can spark anxiety. Concern can allow the person to remain at a level they're willing to take action. Fear can paralyze. So all great points to bring up and things we want to think about. And, and so we want to recognize that these unintended consequences of fear I mean, we might not be trying to create fear, but we need to be mindful in this work that our efforts may create fear and what those unintended consequences may be. So we think it's extremely important this first lesson is about raising concern and hope. Not raising fear, but absolutely raising concern. We need people engaged. We need them to express concern for themselves and for others. We need that part of their brain to be engaged. And we want them to have a sense of a will and a way to move forward. Where is that place to then take their concern and move forward with action? The second lesson we want to look at is embrace learning. Now, to talk about this, I want to talk a little bit about the kinds of challenges you all may face and the kinds of challenges we face. So a technical challenge is one where the problem and the solution are clear. Often with technical challenges, the focus may be on doing it better, faster, cheaper. And it involves often positional leaders or authority. In other words, people in authoritative positions can, can address and make technical uh, challenges be addressed. So a technical challenge is something where maybe I don't know exactly what the solution is, but somebody does. Like it's a problem that can be defined and I can find that expert, and they can tell me what to do, what the solution is, and then we do it. And there are a number of challenges that we face that are technical. Another class of challenges that we may face, and often in the complex health and safety, are adaptive challenges. And this is where the problem and the solution are not clear. These absolutely require learning. And these involve many stakeholders. It's not just going to be a positional authority who can suddenly say we need to move forward and do this, it's going to involve a variety of stakeholders. So I'd like you to think about for a minute some of the challenges that you all face in improving health and safety and whether you think they're technical only, adaptive only, or both. And, and I would wager that they're both. There are certainly technical aspects of what you do, but if we look at an issue, a complex issue, let's say of addressing impaired driving, that's absolutely an adaptive challenge, right? We've got issues around substance use disorders. We've got issues around availability. We've got issues around other people intervening. We've got issues around intervention, treatment. We've got a whole wide array of factors that are coming into a very complex issue. And it's very much, I think, more effective to think of many of our issues through the lens of adaptive challenges. Now, how do we address adaptive challenges? Well, when we think about technical challenges, we know how to do this. We define the problem. We identify the solution. That might be getting some other expertise to help us. We identify and address barriers, and we implement the solution. 
This is classic problem solving. We're good at this. It requires strong management. There are lots of great strong management tools to do it. Adaptive challenges is different. For addressing adaptive challenges, we're going to want to identify the challenge, and then we're going to craft key questions, not answers, but questions, because we don't know the answers. But the questions can hold the space where we can then pursue a new approach. We want to disclose threats. We want to new, new roles, allow new roles to emerge, because we might have to address this very differently than we've addressed things in the past. Right? We don't know how to address this one. So it might be that we need an entirely new role. Conflict may be an opportunity. When people disagree or see it very differently, that could be a great opportunity for us to challenge assumptions and see things in new ways. And so navigating an adaptive challenge is very different than navigating a technical challenge. And if we take a technical problem-solving approach to an adaptive challenge, we can often come up short. And so that's the key lesson is, when am I looking at an adaptive challenge, and when I am, how am I going to shift my approach and not use traditional problem-solving? This will absolutely require us to quiet these voices. The voices of judgment, cynicism, and fear can shut down efforts to really lean into an adaptive challenge and allow new ideas to emerge. Navigating adaptive challenges also can be empowered by thinking about them very differently. Instead of thinking about what problem am I trying to solve, flip the coin and say, what am I trying to grow? What would enable us to thrive? That can really take us to a different approach and a place with an adaptive challenge. We want to build on the past. We don't want to throw it away. We don't want to say everything we've learned is wrong. We want to, but we want to build on it. We want to be able to, to move forward from it. And this is where we absolutely have to embrace learning. We have to go in knowing we don't know. Therefore, what are the questions we need to ask and spend some time to answer? Diversity is key. If we have the same players that we've always had, we're going to see it the same way. If we have diversity, lots of different viewpoints, we're going to start to see it new and differently, and that's going to allow us to break through. The hardest part about adaptive challenges is that they take time. It's hard to forecast how much time. With problem solving, we can lay out a timeline and say it will be done by this period of time. Adaptive challenges, we can't do that. We don't have that degree of specificity. So the second lesson is key. It's around embracing learning. Because, I'm gonna, because of time, I'm going to jump over that, that uh, sharing, but I do want you to think about ways that you embrace learning, ways that you create space for yourself and your team to learn. I now want to talk about the third lesson, which is cultivate transformation. Now, I want to use a metaphor here for about, about change and transformation, a, a biological one. And this is a, a caterpillar and a butterfly. So we can think about simple change as a small caterpillar growing into a big caterpillar. It's experienced change. We can actually measure that change really well. We can take the caterpillar and put it on a scale, and we can measure the change that, it, that, it's, that it's experienced. The change could go both ways. The, the caterpillar could potentially lose weight and, and go backwards. So it can go forwards and backwards. We know how to measure it. It's well-defined. A different kind of change is transformation. In this case, it's when a caterpillar transforms to a butterfly. That's a different kind of change. That's not simple change. That's change of form or transformation. The world of a butterfly is fundamentally different than the world of a caterpillar. It has different rules. It operates differently. It sees the world differently. It can't go back. Once transformed, a butterfly can't go back into becoming a caterpillar. Another critical aspect is that it does not happen overnight. This transformation actually occurs with a caterpillar where it goes through a chrysalis stage it wraps up and literally dissolves its body and is reborn as a new critter. 
We call that the ooey gooey phase, and that's going to be really important because we're going to we're going to make we're going to carry this metaphor over to thinking about people. Now, people don't transform by changing their physical appearance. They transform by the way they see the world. We as individuals transform by changing our mental models, how we understand the world, how we see things. And it's about challenging our core assumptions. That's heavy, big work for individuals. That does not happen overnight. And individuals will absolutely go through an ooey-gooey phase as they let go of their own assumptions and adopt new assumptions. They will be uncomfortable. At times, they may be anxious and even angry, but it's part of the work to get through to the other side. Collectively, we can see transformation as changes across many systems that then transform the overall response. Suddenly, multiple entities within a community are talking about seatbelts, not just law enforcement, but my doctor asked me if I'm wearing a seatbelt. Uh, the hospital is talking to me about seatbelts, and they're doing brief interventions in the ER when somebody comes in from a crash and they weren't wearing a seatbelt. Um, the school is talking to my child about seatbelts. Um, the discussion is everywhere, and suddenly I feel like this community has transformed about traffic safety, but it's this collective response from lots of different changes in, in multiple layers of that community. Transformation is really hard to see when you're in the middle of it. It's easier to see when you look back. Look back at how we used to think about smoking, about drinking and driving, about occupant protection in cars, and even the conversations that are going on now about concussion prevention or about sexual assault within the workplace or about the role of law enforcement. We're right now in some very pivotal transformations about how we understand the role of critical agencies within our communities. And we're absolutely gonna go through some ooey gooey as we experience lots of hard conversations and challenging our assumptions about what's going on. But we've been pushed to that because of these, you know, negative, harmful consequences we're seeing, and it's just time we've got to break through to really challenge some of those assumptions and perhaps create a new way of being as we interact with these various systems. The hard part of transformation is that you cannot transform anyone else. The only person you can transform is yourself. So the work of being a leader is to cultivate transformation. And the gardening metaphor is a really good one. I can't make a seed grow, but I can create the conditions where it's more likely to grow. I can cultivate the soil and prepare it so the seed is more likely to grow. And that's the work of a leader in cultivating transformation. It's creating conditions where transformation can occur. It's creating space, safe space, for very difficult conversations. It's creating space to challenge our core assumptions. It's creating space to quiet the voices of judgment, cynicism, and fear, and allow a new future to emerge, as Otto Sharma would say. Those are all acts of cultivating transformation and critical skills for leaders to embrace if we're going to grow healthier and safer cultures. So that quickly is our third lesson about cultivating transformation. So three lessons, raising concern and hope. It's not just concern, it's hope as well. We need to give people a will and a way. Yes, we need to get them engaged about an issue and then we need to give them a path forward and to create that collective will to move forward. We absolutely have to embrace learning, and particularly as we think about adaptive challenges and this notion that we may not know the answers to these complex problems, and the, the first next step is to pause and ask a question and not look for an immediate solution, but ask the next right question. And then we've got to cultivate transformation. We've got to create conditions where people can start to challenge their mental models 
where they can where we can start to see new futures emerge and 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 create and go through that ooey gooey stand beside people as they let go of their assumptions and move into adopting new assumptions so what i would offer to you as some potential next steps i'd offer you to intentionally block out some time Yes, you've already given an hour of your time during this webinar, and that's a huge investment of your time. But to make use of this webinar, I'd encourage you to block a little bit more time in a time and a space where you can really reflect. And I'd like you to think about the efforts that you're doing. Just make a list of all the things you're doing right now in your work environment, and then ask the question, how can I raise both concern and hope in my efforts? Am I adequately raising concern? Do people really understand the data, the other issues, so they get the concern? And at the same time, am I giving them a path forward? Am I helping them see what they themselves can do to help address this concern? What steps can you take to embrace learning, both for yourself and your team? How can you be the person who starts to ask really powerful questions in meetings that lead your team to new places, to create that space for learning? And how can you cultivate transformation? How can you help others quiet the voices of judgment, cynicism, and fear? How can you help others navigate the ooey gooey when you suddenly sense people are pushing back because they feel like the world is shifting under them, right? That's the sense of we're entering the ooey gooey, we've got some transformation going on here, how can I help cultivate this? How can, I, how can I walk beside somebody and quiet some of those voices, which are often fear because the world is shifting under my feet and I don't know what the new world's going to look like. How can I quiet that fear and give them a path forward so that we can allow this new future to emerge? None of this is easy. There are no simple answers to the questions you're addressing, the questions we're addressing. It's very complex work. But what we hope is that you can use these lessons to, to help be a little bit more effective. And, and that's what we all get up out of bed in the morning for, right? We don't get out of bed in the morning to be busy. We get out of the bed in the morning to be effective. And I hope these lessons can help you do that a little bit. So that's the core of our content. Just a little bit more about the center. We do, we do a, a wide variety of trainings. Right now we are re- uh, inventing some of those trainings to be virtual so that we can reach people in the context of a pandemic and keep the work going, even though we're not able to do face-to-face -face trainings now. Hopefully in the future, we hope to return to face-to-face, -to -face, um, but we do a lot of training. We also do what we call guide service, where we work with individuals or organizations for a period of time, like a year at a time, to really help moving forward with applying some of these ideas. We also develop assessments, surveys, and evaluations to measure culture. This has been a, his, the past five years, a lot of our work to develop good assessments of, let's say, traffic safety culture around a variety of different behaviors or issues so that we understand what are the beliefs that matter. And we also engage in a number of webinars like this. So these, this is a list of some of the webinars that are on our website that you could already listen to, and we'll have more websites or more webinars coming in the future. If you want to learn more about us, you can check us out on our website. You can also follow us on various social media, and you can feel free to call or mail us, uh, email us, and we can try to follow up with you. We, we very much like to do applied research, so we like projects out in the field. We like real live work where we get to work uh, with people side by side and learn from you. Uh, as much as you might learn from us and really move the needle on things that matter. So I want to thank you very much for your time. We do have about three minutes left. This was a lot of content. I wasn't sure exactly how it's going to unfold. So if you've got some questions, you could put them in the chat window or the Q&A box, and I can try to answer them. You can also email them afterwards. This webinar has been recorded. Um, so it will be available that you'd be able to, to listen to it again or share it with others. Uh, in the future. So that is something that you can uh, access and we'll also um, make a PDF of the slides so you'd be able to access the slides and those would be on our web, uh, on our, um, on our web page. So with that, any questions or comments that you want to share either via the chat or the Q&A?
give it a few minutes. Good. So where, what is the center doing to identify and communicate best practices that are working well in specific organizations? So that's a constant ongoing work. Um, some of that is communicated through um, uh, publications that might be on the website. Some of that is often done through uh, webinars that we might do. And um, we are actually now in some of our research moving to a phase of of expanding in terms of our big picture research, we've been spending the past several years really focusing on um, figuring out how to, how to define safety, health and safety culture and how to measure it. So now we are really moving forward towards how to grow it. And so over the coming years, we hope to have more and more answers to that question. Like what are the best practices and methods there? We've got some of that on the website, but I think a lot more to come. And that's certainly an area of, of critical importance and, and where our research is, is the next phases of our research as well. We do have a, a, a framework called the Positive Culture Framework, which really lays out a process. And that process works very well in a wide variety of contexts that it doesn't necessarily define programs or interventions, it's more of a broad framework that you would overlay to help support the adoption of potential programs or interventions that are identified, but we're also working to bolster that catalog of those, those programs and interventions. So very good question. We do have a project with uh, DOTs that we're working on now to help grow safety culture within a DOT. We see that as, a, as an important critical step prior. It's sort of necessary if you're really embracing zero deaths as a state, have you really embraced it as an organization? And if you really embrace a strong safety culture as an organization. So we've, we've got an ongoing project that, that DOTs or other organizations could join to, to work on that. Um, and that, that involves assessment, review of existing practices and then opportunities to augment those, those existing practices based on the assessment. Any other questions? Just give it about a minute. Well, I really appreciate your time and again, I very much appreciate the work that you do. So feel free um, afterwards to, to contact us if you have additional questions. I believe as you exit, you'll be asked a quick um, response um, to uh, understand some of the, the, the um, to, to give some feedback on the webinar. And one more question did come in. Dr. Dr. Cruzado, real supportive of your work. I am not, um, oh, in terms of the president, um, we have some interaction, but, but not a lot of direct interaction. So um, it, it's, it's uh, we're, we're, there's not a lot of direct feedback there. All right, so thank you very much for your time today and have a, a wonderful and safe day and we'll be in touch.